So, hello, um, I'm David Gauntlet. I'm grateful to Danny for inviting me to come along and, and say some words. I think Danny knows that I'm a sort of generalist who can be asked to say some basic points about a thing at the start of a thing. So I've come along to say some basic things. Um, basically, I'll be looking at the three questions that you see here on this zooming press. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a book. It's just some thoughts by me. There's um, people in the world, probably, who've written whole books about what is a book. And some of you might have either written or read some of those books yourself. Um, I'm not such a person. I'm just going to give you a few of my thoughts as a sort of kickoff to the conversations that we're going to have in the rest of the day. Um, so hopefully they're not completely trivial or waste of time to us, but it's just some thoughts from me, basically. That's what we do. Um, then, what do we value about books? It's a slightly different question, perhaps. Um, and how are books changing? So I'm going to make a few basic observations from uh, my, you know, limited knowledge and experience to sort of kick us off and hopefully it'll, it'll then make connections with other stuff during the course of the day. Um, over here, that's me on Twitter, this is the seemingly self-indulgent beginning bit but you can't think to yourself what's well, a seemingly self-indulgent beginning bit because I've already put it up there as a label and I've put the word seemingly implying that it's not really the case. Um, this is just how I come to be uh, you know, how I come to, I do have an interest in this, and uh, this is how I come to have an interest in books. Partly because I've written some books, and also I've made some books, both physical and digital ones, so in that sense, I know something, um, despite not having spent my entire career thinking about what is a book. But I'm very interested in the question of what is a book, I think it's the a, it's a most curious question. Um, you know, you start off, if you ask your gran what is a book, she'll think, it's a very strange question, don't you know? You know we've got some books in the house, they're books straightforward. Even books that go digital when, you know, they're sort of books you can read on a computer or device, you know, straightforward. But it's not straightforward, is it? As soon as you start scratching at that question and unpicking it a bit, you get all kinds of complication. Um, anyway, just on me for a minute then. So there's some books I've written. They're normal kind of books, as <coughs> this imaginary <coughs> gran would call them. They're books that are printed on paper. And um, indeed, amazingly, Polity, the published making is connecting my most recent book, um, they haven't even managed to create ebooks yet. They're still in weird negotiations with Amazon, who are being Amazon. Um, and most publishers have got used to Amazon being Amazon. I'm not going to go into what Amazon is like now, if you don't know. Amazon's a bit of a cheeky company due to its massive reach. Um, most publishers roll over. Polity is just always going, ooh, but shouldn't it be a bit like this? They're idealists. It's lovely. But it also means no ebooks. So they're working on that. Um, so that's normal books, anyway. Uh, but <laughs> 22 years ago, I know I don't look old enough. No, I do look old enough, especially since having children. Um, 22 years ago, um, I did a, it was basically a zine, it was like a fanzine, but I wasn't being a fan of anything except for being a fan of radical feminism, I suppose. I did a zine called Power Cut, which ran to two issues, which in small press terms was, you know, a big success. And the first issue I printed, uh, 800 of them, at Quacks the Printers in York. I was a student at York University. Uh, and that's Quacks the Printers. In the past, you'd have gone, oh, I wonder if Quacks the Printers still exists. Now, of course, you just go on the internet, and there it is. It still looks exactly the same. That's Quacks the Printers today, apparently. But it looked exactly like that 22 years ago. And I went to the place. You won't understand about this, all you young people. But I went to the place with some pieces of what we call paper, right? <laughs> and I gave them to, directly to the actual printing man. And the actual printing man uh, printed them into what we call booklets. Um, and, um, and then he gave them to me in what we called a cardboard box. Um, you, you don't have these now, probably. You probably you don't know what that is. It's a cardboard box. And so it's a cardboard box full of these booklets, you see. And then um, the thing about it was, um, this has given me an anecdote, sort of, that I've used at various points when talking about the internet. Making power cut was basically quite straightforward and easy. You made the pages, I just made pages on A4, they got printed as A5, I made them on A4 um, using a typewriter amongst other things. And you know, I drew some cartoons and stuck them on using what we used to call glue. Um, and then took them to the printer. Uh, and then I got my box, I had to pay some money. You've still got that, I think. Um, I had to pay some money. And, and I got all of these power cuts. That was basically the easy bit. It seemed like, you know, it was quite an amount of work. But that was the easy bit. The really hard bit was distribution. Then I had to get it into bookshops around the country. Um, 
find means of going to those bookshops and going, hello, would you like to have my little book? And, you know, they mostly weren't used to people turning up doing that, though they, you know, there were people that did that. Um, <coughs> and so, and that was a big headache. People would write to me and ask for copies, so I'd have to pick it up and put it in what we called an envelope, put what we called a stamp on it, and so on. Wrote what we used to call their address, that's a postal address, based on, based on their house. You've still got houses, I think. <laughs> um, and so that's a massive palaver. So I'm most, you know, making the zine, which was the interesting bit, basically, that was a straightforward, pleasurable task, which took like, maybe three or four weeks. Uh, getting the thing into people's hands was basically a bit of a nightmare. And I spent the year doing that before I then made the next one, and then I spent another year doing that. Um, why, oh, why, oh, why? This was in like 1991. At which point, um, Tim Berners-Lee was just getting out of bed slowly and finalising his designs for the World Wide Web. Why, oh, why, oh, why could Tim, uh, Tim Berners-Lee not have done that like just two or three years earlier? I'm not asking much. If he'd done that two or three years earlier, well, then I would have been able to just stick all this stuff on the web. It would have been very easy. And I'd have had like a whole two years of my life back. I blame him, and I know he's associated with the University of Southampton, so I want somebody here to have a word with him about that place. <laughs> um, basically, I want my money back. You know what I mean? Um, so that was that. I've also then more recently, I, self, um, I was reading an article by uh, John Norton in The Observer. He's, uh, John Norton writes in The Observer, he writes good columns in The Observer. He just mentioned along the way, whilst having a sort of rant about Amazon, he mentioned that um, you could self-publish books on Kindle, just using a few simple steps. He said it was a few simple steps. Sort of a few simple steps. Um, so I thought, oh well, okay, so I can cobble together some things that I've written that haven't exactly been published all in one place. I make a book that's sort of like that. So I did that, um, and that, that didn't take very long. It was basically quite straightforward. But at one point, I've never shown this to anybody ever, so I thought, ooh, I can show this to you. Um, and you, you'll have very little interest in it, because it looks like a bunch of tedious code. Um, but this is the table of contents file that I had to write for my Kindle book in XML. Very proud I am. Um, I can do HTML, but XML is like HTML, but not written in English. Um, and, and you have to create, a, there's lots of Kindle books in fact in the world which are sort of not very well done and they don't have a proper table of contents and they do it in a shoddy way. I wanted to do it in a, in a way that sort of really worked properly so when you press the contents button it would give you a table of contents, it would go to the right place. Um, so I had to semi-master XML to do that so just, if you could just admire that for like 10 seconds or so. Nobody else has ever admired that or seen it. Uh, so I was, I was pleased to have done that. I was proud of myself, because if you get any tiny bit wrong, then the whole thing doesn't work and it's buggered up. Um, like programming in the past. Um, so I was, I was proud of having done that. And it's one of these things where, um, in Making is Connecting, I talk about the connection between where people making things digitally and people making things physically. And having to carefully knit together this XML file for my Kindle book didn't feel that different to some of the nitty gritty bits of bookmaking when making an actual physical book or a zine. It's sort, of, it's sort of trying to stitch together components so that the thing ends up looking how you want it to look. And although it's digital, it's got a connection with that kind of handmade feel. Having to make a thing in Microsoft in Notepad, which is a program for writing text files in Windows, having to do that nitty gritty kind of work um, feels quite like more kind of hand-based craft work, I think. Anyway, so that's that. So that, that's, that's that. But I'll move on to the actual stuff I'm meant to be talking about. But all of those experiences are fed into my thoughts on this, which, as I said, they're not expert thoughts. Um, you may well have much better thoughts about this than me, but here's just a few thoughts. So what is a book? Seems straightforward. It's not that straightforward, is it? I thought maybe the main thing about it is, well, it's obviously a thing with pages, which I'll come on to in a minute. Or is it a thing with pages? We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, I think it's maybe the nicest thing is to say it's a coherent work through body of ideas. That's what you kind of expect from a book. A book is this kind of whole thing where somebody's spent an amount of time putting together their ideas in quite a substantial kind of way into a whole thing. And then once you've said that, when, for example, artist books can count as that, they don't need to have words in, but it's still a coherent work through body of ideas, which could be purely visual. Um, it's the product of a long, rigorous thought process, I think. Um, then you can immediately say, well, this doesn't apply to all books. You may have been to W.H. Smith and seen some of the books by Jordan. I've not read them, um, but I don't think, I, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that they don't represent the product of a long, rigorous thought process in Jordan's head, because somebody else does it for her, and nobody really minds. Um, Jordan's a glamour model who writes books, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, 
Well, Jordan's a glamour model who gets somebody else to buy books, more to the point. But she keeps most of the money, because that's fair. In some way that you'll, you'll have to talk to an expert on capitalism who'll explain that one to you. Um, so what I'm talking about here is basically what Max Weber would have taught, called an ideal type, which is like the perfect model of what you think the thing really, really should be like. Um, and then in the actual world, when there's lots of examples which aren't exactly like your ideal type, but I'm talking about the ideal type. Um, and you know, books are, books are many things, aren't they? So if you've got a book that's like just a book of 500 castles, for example, then you might think it's a bit of a struggle to say that it's a coherent work through body of ideas. Um, but then, you know, a good book about 500 castles, 500 castles in Britain or 500 castles in Europe or something, well then they've probably thought quite a lot about castles, and it's, it's probably written by a castle expert. And, and based on some ideas about at least what makes a decent castle, um, to follow through this random example. Um, so it's not so far off, you know, guide books and other kinds of books could fit in with that. Children's books, um, you might think they struggle to fit in with this, but they don't really, because, you know, good children's books are clearly based on a, a set of ideas and some values and something they're trying to communicate. Um, and even if they've only got a very small number of words in them, for example, they can still definitely be the product of a long, vigorous thought process. So that's fine. Um, funnily enough, the thing that your grand probably thinks is true, that it's this thing with a cover and some pages inside, that's actually a more problematic one. I feel I'm on quite safe ground saying it's a coherent body of ideas. But um, does a book require a cover and a bunch of pages? I sort of think it does, because otherwise you end up just saying that anything's a book. Like, is a website a book? Mm, website's not really a book, but actually a website does have pages. Um, so it's sort of getting there. Um, some of the digital thing, like just having an app that has information in it, could you then say that's a book? Probably not, it's an app. Why would you want to call it a book? How, why would you call it a book? Maybe because it sort of seems a bit bookish because it's got a cover and some pages. Um, but I don't know if this is necessary or not. This is the kind of stuff we'll probably be talking about today, I suppose. Um, I think probably that does actually help your definition. It sounds like the most banal thing to say, oh, well, a book's obviously this thing that's got a cover and it's got some pages inside. But maybe that is at least the, the basic thing that you do. Um, then, a little bit different, this one. A book is disruptive. Does a book have to be disruptive? Um, the 500 Castles book probably isn't disruptive. Um, in terms of, well, you know, it might change how you think about castles. Um, children's books, which, you know, uh, they, they might change how you see the world. So then they are disruptive. I just, this is obviously not something you'd find in a standard definition of what a book is. But if you think about books that you've loved, whether fiction or non-fiction, they've probably changed how you see the world in some way. You know, that, that would probably be what makes them good, I'd have thought. Um, even if, you know, not necessarily in a political way, but maybe in a poetic way, or just how you look at things, how you think about relationships or nature or anything else, a good book probably is disruptive in some way. Um, this is just a, a thought from me. I don't know if anybody else ever said this. Um, I think they probably did. Um, so I was just thinking about, you know, some books that I think it was really sort of key books in my life or my thinking, I suppose, like thinking about Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume 1 or Dalek of Sex, or Illich, or John Ruskin, or anything about, uh, say, the graphic novel Ghost World, which changes how I thought about graphic novels, or uh, Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, which I read at a pretty early age in my fiction reading life and sort of blew me away in terms of what uh, a book could do. Um, so they're, they're all disruptive in different ways, not necessarily disruptive in terms of, you know, causing you damage or changing how you think politically, but in terms of how you see the world, then maybe disruptive is part of it. So those are some thoughts about what is a book. Basically four thoughts. Surely there are more, which we can talk about as the day goes on. So then what do we value about books? It ends up being a sort of similar list. I think I've kept two of them, um, but then there's other ones that might be different. You probably want it to be a coherent work through body of ideas. That's what is a good thing about a book. I've also got disruptive down there, because I think that's a good one that you want to keep as well. But also, something tangible, perhaps, you know, a book is a thing that you can have and hold. Um, a social object, you know, you can give it to your friend and say, I enjoyed this book, it's a really nice book, follow this book, and it's a nice thing to receive. Uh, you know, books make great presents, all of that. Um, and also they're objects, you can have those objects in your home. So also, they're a container of ideas, but also a reminder of ideas. I don't know if you treat books in this way, but I sort of, um, I sort of buy books to remind myself that I'm interested in something, or it's a sort of marker of, uh, you know, my interests are kind of like this, this and this, uh, which I'm not really displaying to anybody else. Nobody ever really looks at my bookshelves, because um, they're upstairs. Um, 
So it's, it's more of a kind of reminder to me, or sort of setting up sort of as a sort of museum of my mind like that. And maybe you, you relate to books in that way, or not. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so there's something, if you go back to that one, something tangible, does that mean it needs to be physical? Obviously not, if we're talking about digital books. But there's something about it, at least as a social object, which maybe you lose when you move to the digital realm, or maybe you don't. Or maybe there's things we can do to kind of preserve that kind of character of books. Um, I'm not sure I necessarily know what they are. Um, and then, again, if a book changes how you see the world, that seems like a good thing for a book to do. That's one of the things we'd want to keep, again, as we go to digital books. Um, is that how a book's changing? This is all straightforward and uh, you know, basic stuff. If they're no longer tangible, if it's no longer a thing that I can just pluck off my shelf and go, oh, this, it's great. And you can be like, oh, yes, it does look good. It's got a fascinating back cover, which I look at now, but then I can open the pages. Oh, here's an interesting bit, you know, got some pictures in the middle. Looks nice. If it's no, if it's no longer that, because it's just a thing that's inside my device, um, then do we lose something then? I do now, I haven't got a Kindle device. I keep mentioning Kindle. Other ebook readers are available, of course, like the BBC says whenever it talks about the Radio Times. Um, other ebook readers are available, but Kindle is clearly the most popular one. I mean, it's factually the most popular one, isn't it? Um, there's problems with Kindle, of course. Um, do I need to say what the problems with Kindle are? Uh, it's a proprietary format, so it's Amazon's format. I keep now buying Kindle books to read on my phone. I've just got a sort of smartphone like you probably have. Um, but I find it very easy and comfortable to read books on my phone. And you can just pull it out of your book pocket at any time. So like many other people, this is also a statistic, people who used to read books and then got a Kindle, they read more books now. They're buying more books off Amazon, which makes Jeff Bezos from Amazon very happy. Um, but it's also an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? And it's partly just because you can just plug it out of your pocket any time. I've got five minutes waiting for a train. That would normally be kind of a wasted five minutes because I sort of think, oh, it's only five minutes. It's not worth like getting a book out or something. And reading books on train platforms is also a bit tricky, isn't it? Um, but, you know, take it out. You get another five minutes through your book and so on and so on and so on. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of the examples of places you can possibly look at your phone. But um, it, it changes. It, it, you know, it's a it's a valuable property, despite losing this nice tangibility of the actual book. Um, are books no longer social then? I don't know the answer to that one. You do lose you, you lose something, don't you, when you haven't got this book that you can share with people. Also, being able to see what people are reading. For example, um, my wife reads quite a lot of books, and so I used to know what books she was reading because she would, you know, she'd be sitting there reading a book. You'd see it. You'd ask questions about it. You'd have a conversation. Um, now she reads books also on her phone, uh, having downloaded the Kindle app, and, and that's very convenient, works well. We've got a, a baby and a little boy, and being able to just pull it out of your pocket when you're doing something with your baby, you know, trying to get your baby to go to sleep or something, um, very convenient. But I don't know what book she's reading anymore. And then occasionally it just turns out that she's read some book or other, I'm like, you've read that, when did you read that? And of course, it was on her phone, I didn't know she was reading it. So you've lost that social dimension as well, the thing about conversations, being able to see what people are reading. Um, some people find it quite nice, of course, that like you can read a Kindle on the train and nobody knows what you're reading, and so you haven't got nosy sort of people making judgments about you. You're like, oh, you know, you like John Grisham, do you? That kind of thing. And um, you get around all of that, or you know, John Grisham was a not as embarrassing example as I could have said. Um, Says so that. Then, of course, if it's digital, then it's potentially interactive. Um, hyperlinked is more straightforward. You just have links within a book that take you to relevant web pages or, or enable you just to hop around inside the book. That, that's useful, that's fine. Um, it's not that different to a book sort of suggest a printed book suggesting websites or things you could look at, is it? Um, but then, if a book is more interactive than that and does all kinds of whizzy interactive things, then maybe it starts to not really be what we call a book, or maybe it becomes just it's a, it's a computer program, or it's a thing, it's an app with information in it, is it still a book? It enters into that fuzzy zone where we're not quite sure anymore. So you've got that question again, which you already talked about. Does it need to have pages? Would pages be the most basic element of a book? I don't know. I'm not going to stand here and try and work it out, because I haven't worked it out so far, and I can't work it out now. Um, I think maybe, I'll say yes anyway. Then people during the day who want to talk about the nature of the book can say, unlike David Gauntlet's <laughs> foolish view, books do not need pages, and here's why. Um, I think maybe pages is just like the basic thing. So you, you know, it's a set of ideas set out across some pages. It's got some kind of order to it, probably. Of course, there's been 
printed books as well as other kinds of books which don't necessarily take a linear order, but um, you don't have to read them in a linear order. Okay. But some kind of pages, maybe that's the basic thing. Let's move on before I bore you to tears with not knowing whether or not a book needs pages. Um, certainly easy to make yourself, easy DIY I've summarised there. Um, in the past, very obvious thing, in the past you wanted to write a book, okay, you could write a book, but then you wanted people to be able to read it, well then you had to get it past a publisher, big gatekeepers. Um, you could do self-publishing, then you have that problem of distribution that I've already talked about. So basically to do it in a way that got an audience, you needed a publisher, publishers received, so I used to read books about publishing because I went in, back in the day, before you had digital books, um, and you're always reading these facts about how they had a, a slush pile of manuscripts coming in where they'd receive like a thousand books every week, and every week they were publishing like two or three and your chances of getting published are incredibly tiny. Uh, even the chances of getting publishers to look at your manuscript are incredibly tiny. Um, so that was a you know, pretty terrible position for people who wanted to create their own book. Now, very straightforward. Um, via the Amazon website, to go back to the Kindle thing, um, there's a sort of uh, program, is it a program? program, which uh, will convert a Microsoft Word file into a Kindle book, basically. Um, it doesn't do it brilliantly well, or at least you need to tinker with it. That's why I had to create my own table of contents and all of that. But basically, to create a, a book that people can read on their Kindle, you can just convert a Microsoft Word document just like that, and turn it into a book and sell it. You can start selling it straight away. It's got a whole platform where you set it up, you just tell it how much you want to charge for the book in different countries, and there you go. Um, so it's very straightforward, and people can now print them, create, print, we used to call it print, publish, that's the word, publish their own books straightforwardly, and people are reading more apparently, as I've said. Um, you know, partly you have to be cautious because this would be part of the PR advertising kind of thing for Kindle, wouldn't it, that Jeff Bezos would want to say, people are reading hundreds more books than they've ever read before. Um, but I think it's true. It appears to be based on actual facts. Um, then there's other things which we we'll may talk about during the course of the day. Print on demand, that means that having created my Kindle book, I've never done this. I only thought about doing it this morning whilst um, scribbling some bonus notes. I could actually turn my Kindle book into an actual book to have it to hold, couldn't I? I've not done that. But the reason I thought that in my mind is because I was writing a note to myself about how I do like physical books, I like digital books as well, but I like physical books. And imagine if you'd written a book, but then you didn't actually get a book to hold, it only came out digitally. Um, that would seem really disappointing. Then I remembered that I'd actually done that uh, with the Kindle book and I didn't feel that disappointed. But that's because it doesn't really feel like one of my proper books. It's a kind of collection of stuff. I don't mind too much. Um, but it'd be quite surprising to see it's an actual book. I'd have a whole different relationship with it. It was like this book that I could like flick through and go, oh, I made a book. Um, print on demand means that you can just create single copies of any electronic book. Um, that's pretty obvious, you probably know that. Um, but again, that makes things different because it means that you can not only create digital books and distribute them very easily, but you can also have print versions as well if you want. Um, and they tend to be somewhat more expensive than a book that there's thousands of copies of, but that makes sense. Um, there's also open access, a whole other thing. Uh, in the world of academia, um, which you may or may not be especially part of, I don't know, um, then people are talking about open access all the time. I mean, open access just means making stuff free online, basically. And it's mostly a conversation these days about journal articles. If journal articles are based on publicly funded research, shouldn't they just be available free online to anybody? And universities are shifting and being requested, demanded to do this more by the funders. The funders say, if, you've, if we've funded your research, and then you've locked it away in a journal which costs hundreds, literally hundreds of pounds for anybody to subscribe to, or for libraries to subscribe to. Isn't that rather awkward of you? We want you to make it available to everybody. Um, but people don't normally talk about books very much in this, so it's an interesting thing for book people, like you. Um, it's weird that there's just all this talk about papers, as if all academic work comes out in scientific papers. Um, but of course it doesn't, and the arts and humanities is a massive part of what goes on in universities. Science, which people talk about in this debate and talk about in terms of higher education funding and all kinds of other things, it tends to dominate. It's only like 60% of what people do in universities. The other 40% of people are doing other stuff, arts and humanities kind of stuff. And they're writing books. And books are typically the thing that have really moved the field on often. Um, I was at a thing uh, with, this is a while ago now, but the, the old head of research at the AHRC who was called Shira West, and she was doing this very impassioned speech for how now everybody got to do collaborative international projects, sort of big EU-type funded projects. 
and that's the way that research should be. And, you know, I don't mind that. And I like interdisciplinarity when it's people being genuinely interdisciplinary. But what they were actually being enthusiastic about here was just people basically staying in their disciplines, but talking to each other. That's a start, it's okay, I suppose. And being in different countries, because that's good, and <laughs> it's fine, I mind. But this idea was that all kind of academic work and produce and research would basically be best if it was part of a massive international network uh, of people working on very big projects. Um, and you think, okay, you know, I'm sure there's a place for that, that's fine. But if you think about what has really changed your field, you probably open a wide range of fields. Like if I think about my background, which is kind of sociology, cultural <coughs> studies, and that kind of thing, then what has made a difference is things like Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality, Volume 1. That's a book written by one man, you know, on his own, <laughs> and it's published, and has a really big impact across a, a wide range of fields, in fact. It changes, you know, literature, it changes sociology, it changes psychology, it changes <sighs> philosophy. Massive impact, which comes from one book written by one man sitting in a library in Paris. Um, and then think of uh, some international network project which has had that kind of impact. I can't think of any. They're always kind of really weird and anonymous kind of thing. So um, maybe I've moved on to, no, I haven't moved away from what I'm meant to be talking about, have I? Because I'm talking about the impact of one book written by one individual. In the arts and humanities, it tends to be the most significant thing, I think. And uh, funding councils and other people tend to sort of forget that in their excited drive for interdisciplinary international networks. I don't mind interdisciplinary international networks. I'm part of some. but. Um, I'm not sure that this idea that uh, you know, that's where the really big ideas are going to come from is actually true. Um, open access for books. There's a, people are starting to do different kind of projects about open access for books. Um, it maybe has more tensions than in science, because for one thing, it's the way in which people in the arts and humanities used to make a bit of extra money for themselves by writing books which people would actually buy. Uh, and now if we're just going to give them away, that seems slightly disappointing when you're in Sainsbury's wondering if you can afford an extra bag of crisps. But that shouldn't be the driving force for the dissemination of knowledge, probably. Finally, anything more futuristic? So far, um, I've, uh, this is kind of a conservative introduction, I think, to how books are changing, because I could have basically introduced, you know, I could have gone, oh, well, in my bag, I've got a digital owl, and that's a book. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, OK. It's, it's in white. You know. Um, I think I'm probably being relatively conservative. I'm saying it probably has pages. <laughs> it can, I think the book definitely is a coherent body of ideas. Um, and you know, the kind of changes I'm talking about are straightforward kind of shifts from physical to digital. But you can stretch it much more, of course. Maybe there's some crazy experimental people in the room today who'll be talking about that. Things which don't really seem like a book at all to somebody as old as me. I'm 42. Um, but then when you start having anything that sort of really pushes the envelope in what a book is, so that it doesn't remind somebody like me of what a book is, you sort of think, well, is it really a book? What's the point in calling it a book? Why do you want to call it a book when you've just created something else? Something that's a, a, a way of explaining ideas, something wonderful? That's good. Why do you need to call it a book? So maybe that's one of the things we'll be looking at again today. Um, I'll just soup back to that then. Um, concluding wise, I don't have the answers, I think. <laughs> but in terms of what is a book, we do need to cling on to certain things and not just say, oh, you know, it's all just apps now. Apps have replaced books or something, or apps have become books. I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, and the thing about it being a container of ideas, something that links people together, ideally perhaps some kind of shareable object or a thing that creates conversations between people, makes links between people. That's always good. A very vital and important part of books is uh, it's the sharing of ideas from like the book to your brain, but it's also about how people create networks and communities around books. That can still happen, so I think we're okay. But um, that's some thoughts from me. I'm going to stop now and let some other people talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah.